such a joy for me to get to see you guys again. Thank you for being here. I am so excited. Pastor Don, if you'll grab a seat. We have three of, of Don's books. We only were able to get about 50 copies or so a piece. So use your Christian charity as you take these. That means don't grab six of them and go stick them on eBay. Um, <laughs> God's Promise and the Future of Israel, the Handbook for the End Times, Hope, Help, and Encouragement for Living in the Last Days. By the way, we can all use that. Biblically, we've been in the last days since the resurrection of Jesus. We don't know what's happening today or tomorrow, but we see seasons, if not moments, and we are certainly there. Your people shall be my people. This is how Israel, the Jews, and the Christian church will come together in the last days. And so uh, you've got these, they're over here, and um, I, I urge you to figure out with Brent how those can possibly be shared without people fighting over them. Second announcement from me before we get to the interview. Next Sunday, we'll start a new series. I'm incredibly excited about this series. This is a series that I was asked to teach, um, uh, and, and I'm honored to teach it. The series is going to be, so you can start getting ready and get your friends ready, going to teach on the law. Now, if you're saying, blah, lawyer on the law, no, don't blah, this is be, wee, okay, because... What most people don't understand is the law is a reflection of God's character and ethics set in a culture and in a time. So as culture and time changes, some of those laws, you know, Jesus is, is quick to say, hey, that was then, this is now. But some of them don't change because the, the, the and, and we're going to look at that but we're going to look at the law as a reflection of the character of God and see what can we learn about God by studying his law. Eating kosher. What does that say about the character of God? It's going to be fascinating. I hope you'll tune in or come. Now, today, if I hold up my hand and count the five spiritual mentors that have been used by God to shape who I am, one of those five is sitting with me up here. This is Don Finto. If you like anything and find anything that I teach godly, it would not be so were it not for this gentleman who was my pastor, my preacher, my minister when I was in college. And so I want you to get to know him. I want some of him to rub off on you. He is 90 years old. <laughs> so he's just getting warmed up. Amen. <laughs> I have my notes. I want to get right into it. I want you to get to know him to some measure the way uh, uh, I've gotten to. And, and I'm just thrilled. Don, thank you for this weekend. From uh, deep in my blessing. soul. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, tell everybody a little bit about you and then I'll start asking questions but just let them know a little bit who is Don Finto hmm let me oh, okay I have to tell you something that's funny I walked into a mall in Nashville one time and I noticed this lady was kind of looking at me and I figured oh well, she knew me or something and finally she walked over to me and said do you know Don Finto <laughs> and I was so stunned, I didn't know what to say. And she said, you look just like him. <laughs> <laughs> and I finally said, well, I do know him, not as well as I'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> but then I said, I'm done. <laughs> okay. Fixed it. Fixed it. Fixed right. it. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. All right. So, I, you know, God uses everything to shape us. And as, as I've been telling people, you know, some of the stuff that I grew up in, I, I had a very secure rearing in some ways. My grandparents were godly, godly people. 
you you were not raised by your mom and dad. No, my no. my dad had left the family when I was two. I finally got acquainted with him when I was an adult, but he was already an invalid by that time. And I first time I ever met him, I carried him to the car and drove him around his farm up in near Lubbock, up in Leveland, up in that area. And so I never really spent any time with him at all. He had he. And his wife, the woman that he left my mother for, both, became, both turned back to the Lord. And actually, I did both their funerals. Yeah, yeah, wow. they asked me to. And so I did. Wow. Uh, and, my gran- and, and, and he was, he came and asked my grandparents for forgiveness and what he had done. And my grandmother was a godly woman. And she, she sent him pajamas in the nursing home. And, you know, she said, if you forgive somebody, you forgive them. And so it was, it was really, it was super. So he left. What year were you born? I was born in 30. 1930. And, and he left in 32, February of 32. And when did your mom pass away? Uh, two years later, when I was four. And so you were raised by your grandparents. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember Lubbock. a little bit about my mother, but not too much. And then my grandparents were, and they had had 10 children of their own. And then my, I have three older sisters, five, seven, and nine years older. So I'm number 14 of the ones that they raised. So my grandmother had school children for 40 years. but. Wow. My grandmother was, I credit my grandmother, okay, uh, there are three people in my life that were major, major encouragers, and I, I credit all of them with an aspect of what, of, of, of what I wanted to be. My grandmother was this huge encourager. I mean, she always saw good in people, and she did in me. She saw good in me when there wasn't a lot of good in me, but she, she kept bringing it out. And then I had a I had a voice teacher, I mean, that I didn't, couldn't pay for voice lessons in Abilene Christian, but I had a voice teacher, Ms. Adams, who gave me a voice lesson one day, and she, I sang like Caruso that day, I mean, because <laughs> she didn't tell me what I was doing wrong, she told me how to stand, and all this kind of thing, it was, it was huge, I mean, but just what she did for me that day left its mark on me, and then when I went to Germany, I had a teacher, I had a, I had a private tutor learning German, Frau Dr. Erika Weigand, and she saw in me the possibility that I could speak German without an accent and wouldn't be known as an, with a typical American accent. And I so believed her that she spoke, she wouldn't let me speak anything. I mean, I, I practiced 15 minutes one day saying the, the name for Munich in German, München. München. It's a U umlaut and a soft C-H. Anyway, but the thing is, I think all that helped me. I, I, I'm an encourager. And when I found out that I was an encourager, I just, I remember when I finally realized, oh, that's who you are. And you're not an administrator. I took a test one time in Houston. Some lady gave me a test and she said, by the time you brush your teeth in the morning, you've used up all your administrative skills. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so good because it made me realize I had the people around me that were administrators. But I was an encourager, and I remember walking into Belmont at Wednesday night when I realized I was an encourager. I'd touch people. I would say something to people. I just knew that even touching people. Anyway, that's... So that's, that's who you are. That's who I am. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> now, how did you... How did you come to, to, to a, a vibrant walk with the Lord? How did you come to faith? How did you, I mean, you're brought up in a Christian home by yeah. your grandparents. Maybe there wasn't that seminal moment or? I, I think I always, because I'd had some junk in my childhood, I think I was really hungry for God, even in my childhood. I can remember really wanting to follow the Lord. And I think I asked my grandparents at probably age nine or something like that, if I could be baptized. No, you're too young. But they finally, I got under the wire. I didn't, I, I did it at 11, not 12. <laughs> and so, <laughs> but I, and I remember the day I was baptized, hanging my clothes on the line and feeling, ah, I'm, I'm, I'm free. I mean, I've, you know, my sins are washed away. But, but by the next morning, I'd thought things that weren't right, and so, I, oh. and I grew up in that I didn't know the gospel, and I, I thought I'd try to confess all my sins before I went to sleep and then not think anything bad before I went to sleep because I thought if I'd sought something bad while I was in my sleep, I would go to hell if I if didn't died. have time to confess it, <laughs> and then I would get up in the morning and try to 
get all my sins confessed by the time I got to the Anyway, I mean, and it took me a while to, but I was hungry for the gospel. And so the first real message that grabbed me in the churches of Christ where I grew up, and I got famous for it in a way, was the grace message. I mean, I really grabbed it so that I spoke at Harding and I was Pepperdine and all over because it was not a message that was being spoken in the, in the churches of Christ at that time. Thank God it is now in yeah, a lot of the churches. Yeah. Well, and I grew up in a church, uh, church of Christ background, and the class knows this. Is back. We've got a number of church of Christ background people in this class. But uh, uh, I, I grew up in, in the church of Christ, and I met Jesus there, and I met the gospel there. But it, it, there was also a very strong legalistic, you're saved because you know it right and you're doing it right uh, group within that church. And so that, that uh, uh, I, I think in some ways where you have the deepest darkness, you've got some of the purest light. Absolutely. And so, yeah. But, but you see, I, I really believe that I still am doing what I learned to do in the Church of Christ. Read the book and do it. Yeah. Yeah. And we really did say that. But let, oh, let me tell you, <laughs> but a, a seminal moment in my life, I was in, we were in Germany when Martha and I first married. We lived there for several years. And, and there was a, an, what appeared to me to be an arrogant freshman university student at the University of Hamburg that wrote me an open card. And it said, and I'll do it in English, but he said, Dear Don Finto, do you ever read the Bible just to find out what it says? Or do you just read it to prepare a sermon? I shredded that card as quick as I got it, but not before I had it memorized. <laughs> because <laughs> I knew he had caught me. Because I realized that I was reading the Bible to try to prove what I had been taught. And, I, and so one of the things that I challenge people, don't be bound by any kind of background, any denominational background, anything you've been taught. Read the book and pray the Holy Spirit and, and learn what it says. And yeah, and so that has been huge for me. Well, you, you set me on the course of memorizing Scripture in bulk. When I was a 15-year-old boy and you and I had lunch one day in Roswell, New Mexico, uh, where you were preaching a gospel meeting, uh, you, you took time out for this 15-year-old snotty-nosed kid from Lubbock, <laughs> and you challenged me to start memorizing Scripture in bulk. And I have always, you, you're not a proud man. You always give glory to God, and I've never heard you brag one time in your life, but I've been dying to ask you, if you look through your 90 years, how much of the Bible at times have you committed to memory? I, you did, I know you did 1 Corinthians. I know you did Philippians. I know you did Romans. <laughs> he preached four sermons on Romans <laughs> on, a sun, on four Sundays. But all he did is stand up there and quote Romans. Three chapters. So you did one through... One through four. One through four. Five through eight. Five through eight. Nine, nine ten, and ten, eleven. eleven. And then twelve through sixteen. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I know you've done so many of the Psalms. I know you've done a good bit of Isaiah. What, what, am, I, what am I missing? <laughs> um, <laughs> Did you do the I mean, on the Mount? Oh, yeah, at one point. Yeah, yeah uh, one, of our, one of our guys who's an actor and I spoke it together, just walked through the congregation speaking it. He'd take a piece and I'd take a piece one, one day. But uh, Mike Blanton, who's a Texan and one of Amy's, what? promoters and so forth, uh, he tells the story, and I do kind of remember it, but anyway, he came over to my house one day, and I just started speaking to him, and all of a sudden, he thought, wait a minute, this, this he's, he's, talking, he's speaking Scripture, and then all of a sudden, he realized I was speaking Colossians to him. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when Todd McDowell's sitting out here, he and Rachel, and we're walking together real closely, and when we first started going, uh, the fellow that prophesied to us that we were supposed to be together challenged us and said Philippians would be important to me. So I, I grabbed that. And it's perfect, you know, and just one day just looked at him and just started speaking it. I mean, I've, 
I, I'm still doing it to some extent. I mean, and most of the time, it's, I tell people, it's, I, I, you know, I call it downloading to my hard drive rather than memorizing. Memorizing sounds too hard. But if you just download that scripture to your hard drive, then. <laughs> but the, the only time that it's ever been easy for me, it was shocking. I was going to Israel, and I went out to a place in Nashville, Radnor Lake, to walk. And I, I thought, well, I'm going to memorize Isaiah 19. Arise and shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is rising on you, and, and so forth. Because it's talking specifically to Israel, secondarily to us. And so I went walking with the Lord for a little over an hour, and I had it. I thought, I can't believe I've got this. I mean, it didn't take me long. I mean, it, it had to be the Lord. So I thought, well, I'm going back tomorrow, and I'm going to do 61. And, and for three days, I had 60, 61, 62. And I, I've never had anything like that before. And so, man, I'm ready to go to Israel now. And so, so I have to speak this. And so what I did is, when I got to Israel, I walked the ramparts of the city of Jerusalem, speaking those words over Israel. <laughs> wow, wow. All right. Now, we need to catch up a little bit. Where did you meet Martha? Martha, how long ago did Martha die? Four years ago. Four years ago. After 60, 64 years. 64 years of marriage. Yeah. How did you meet Martha? <laughs> uh, I was leading singing for a meeting that Willard Collins was doing at Union Avenue Church of Christ in Memphis. My senior year in college, I was 20, or maybe I was only 19 then, but... but but anyway, I was invited to go to Memphis to lead singing for a meeting. I stayed with Melvin Wise, who was the minister there. And he said, well, there's a wedding tonight, Don. You want to go with me? And I said, sure. And so I walked, we walked into the foyer of the Union Avenue Church building. And Mrs. Graves and Martha were standing there. And Melvin introduced me to Mrs. Graves, who introduced me to her daughter. I went home. That, I went back to, the, to his house that night. And I said, tell me about that blonde that you introduced me to. He said, well, she's engaged, Don. I said, she didn't have a ring on. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know how that goes. You always wanted to know. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, the long and short of it is, I mean, it, she had been dating this guy for, all for, for four years in college, but she would go out with me when she came to Memphis. And then I went to Memphis and li I stayed at her home church and ministered with youth and song leading and all that kind of thing for a year before we then formed with Germany. And anyway, she, I made some people mad at Lipscomb, people that, I mean, Nika, Nika Stevens is out here somewhere. And Nika's she knew, right there. <laughs> she, knew, she knew Martha before I did. And, uh, and she got mad at me, she said, because, because Johnny, her, the guy she was walking with, you know, was everybody knew him and loved him. And I don't know, I have no to this day, I was, I think I was crazily naive. But anyway, I went there and visited her and sat with her in chapel. And anyway, she wrote me a letter and said that she and Johnny were going to be engaged before school was out. And I wrote her back and I said, I think, I don't think that's a good idea at all. I mean, you've been in an artificial situation for four years. You need to get out and see if this is the real thing. And she was furious but when she got home, she didn't have a ring. And so we started going out together. This was early June. And by August and September, we were engaged and married the next day. Did you get her a ring? Well, let me tell you, <laughs> let me tell you, let me tell you what was funny. We were traveling all over that summer. And there was a guy walked up to me. We were in Columbus, Mississippi. And a guy walked up to me and handed me a card and said, I'm a wholesale jeweler, if you ever need Wholesale me. jeweler. Yeah. And so I stuck his card in the pocket. Well, I'm a country bumpkin. I don't know protocol. Martha was this charming, dignified, stately woman. Time out, time out, time out. <laughs> I have got most of these people believing that if you're from anywhere around Lubbock, you are not a country bumpkin. Oh. You, Lubbock is the hub of the plains. So be real careful there. Okay, just be I, real careful. But see, I didn't grow up in Lubbock. Okay, so. fair enough. You I were about I 20 even, miles outside. I didn't even grow up in La Mesa. Okay. I grew up eight miles out. And a eight down miles neighbor out, was <laughs> country bumpkin. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> so you're a so, country bumpkin. So it's getting, I'm soon going to have to come back to La Mesa because they're going to support me while I'm in Germany. And I'm getting nervous because... I'm going to leave pretty soon. And so 
But a couple of days before I was leaving to come back, we were sitting back, I was sitting on her front porch, and I said, do you love Johnny? Yeah. Enough to marry him? No. You love me? Yeah. Enough to marry me? Yeah. Well, good night. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so I called the wholesale jeweler the next day. I tell you, I'm a country pumpkin. I didn't know to ask her dad. And I brought the rings back the next night. <laughs> <laughs> and how many years were you married? 64. It worked. 64. It worked. It worked. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, Christian love. So you and Martha went to Germany and yeah. you started a church there. You were a missionary. We were, in, we were Frankfurters for the first eight or ten months and we became hamburgers. We were in Hamburg for the eight years. And yeah, we went up there with Weldon Bennett and Dieter Goebel, who was a German fellow, and started the Church of Christ up in Hamburg. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> and then you moved back to the States. I want to quickly get through some of your ministry uh, as a pulpit minister. You came back. Did you come straight to Nashville? No. Three years in Memphis. I worked as an associate with uh, White Station Church of Christ in Memphis and went to Hardy Graduate School and got a master's degree there. White Station. Mom, did we go to that church? We went there. Yeah. When were you there? I was there 60 to 63. Okay, we didn't get there till about 64, Mom, about there. Somewhere around there. That's yeah. interesting. Wow. Um, okay, so then you moved to Nashville. I'm going to jettison forward. You, when I met you, you were preaching at a church called Belmont. Now, in Baptist circles, Belmont's a reference to the college. Yeah. But that church had nothing to do with Belmont the is the area of town. It originally was Belmont Avenue Church of Christ. Yeah. And then while you were there, y'all dropped we, that. Well, <laughs> we were continually, when we, particularly when we started using instruments, we were always having to tell people, yeah, we're not like the, the other churches of Christ. And so finally we just, of all things, we dropped the of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and just became Belmont Church. <laughs> yeah, looking back, you might have. But and, and Billy, in one of the Billy Graham meetings, I'm standing and talking with some people, and he said, "Now where are you? Now where do you? Where do you pastor?" And I said, "Belmont Avenue Church of Christ." He said, "Oh, you don't." He didn't <laughs> think that a Church of Christ guy would be in the Billy Graham meeting. <laughs> <laughs> well, he didn't know you. Um, uh, um, okay, so you pastored. The Belmont Church, um, so I can think of Wednesday nights with Michael W. Smith at the piano leading singing. Um, you've got people like Amy Grant at your church. You've got Michael Blanton. You've got Brown Bannister. Brown Bannister. You've got all of these icons of contemporary Christian music. <laughs> How did you pastor a church like that? Well, I, first of all, I thought it was hilarious. When I, when I backed away and started thinking about it, I thought it was absolutely hilarious that God chose a non-instrumental, because we were still non-instrumental music at that time. We had a coffee house at Cornelia, and we knew... That was a bookstore across the street. Yeah, and, and, and on our... When we got the new people that came to Belmont joining the old people, and we didn't lose anybody. It's crazy. We only about... 65 people when we went there, but the Jesus people all started coming. So within, within weeks, we had hundreds, you know, and, and, and so we, we had to have some kind of venue. And so across the street, we rented a place and we knew that all the elders wouldn't be for it. And so some of our elders. Elders were, are like, think deacons yeah, in the Baptist church. Yeah, but some of us, some of us joined together to have this place where we could use instruments and worship and everything. And there was more people coming to the Lord over there, but they'd come over to the church building and use the baptistry. But it was, we also used swimming pools and Little Harpeth River and everything during the Jesus movement. But, but anyway, it, it was hilarious because we would do that. And, and they gave it, the, uh, we, the elders, gave permission to us, some of the elders and other people, to start the, the bookstore and coffee house ministry. And that's where we had all the people that were anywhere in, mess, in, in, in Christian music that, that came there at some point. We had all these concerts all the time. So the Jesus movement itself in Nashville, uh, this is 
early 70s, late 60s, early 70s? Yeah, early 70s. 67 is when it really started, but I went there in 71, so yeah. So right in there. So you go to a church with 65 people, and all of a sudden the, you start ministering to Jesus people, uh, Jesus movement people. That's a polite way of saying a bunch of hippies? Exactly. Okay. That we call, I mean, when they turned, turned to the Lord, they called them Jesus freaks. Jesus they freaks. Didn't, they didn't dress right, and most churches didn't want them because they didn't want their bare feet on their rugs. They didn't want them coming. I mean, I, I told. I, <laughs> you, you, but that was a limited crowd. Tell the story of the fella. Well, there was a fella. One day there was a fella sitting on the front row that had overalls on but no shirt. And one of, the, one of our older elders that had been there for, was there when we came, came over to me and said, who's the guy on the front row? I said, he's a guest. He said, oh, okay. In other words, if he's a guest, leave him alone. But if he's one of us, tell him to put a shirt on. <laughs> so, so you get, how did the Jesus people, Jesus movement people, how did these hippies realize they'd be welcome at your church? That they're what now? That they would be welcome at Belmont. Just I may, maybe it was because the Cornelia Coffee House. I'm not sure. But, I mean, we just were. I mean, we, in fact, there's a funny story that uh, a guy named Gary Paxton, uh, somebody may have heard of his name. He, was, he wrote crazy songs. I mentioned it the other day. If you're happy, notify your face. And a funny thing happened on the way to hell. I got wait, saved. Wait, wait, wait. I don't want that to be lost. <laughs> he wrote a song, If You're Happy, Notify Your Face. <laughs> what was another one? If, uh, a funny thing happened on the way to hell. I got saved. Uh, <laughs> a funny thing happened on the way to hell. I got saved. If, uh, That's a classic. If nobody loves you, create the demand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So anyway, but he came to Nashville. He had been wealthy and bankrupt, and he came to Nashville bankrupt and was living with his common-law wife, Karen. And when he'd get good and drunk, he would start reading his Bible and want to go to church. And they'd drive up in front of these church buildings, and they'd say, we can't go in there. Look at how they're dressed. We're We've got Salvation Army clothes on. But there was a, at that time, there was a drugstore across the street from the Belmont Church building. And one night, they came to the drugstore, and they saw people going in, all kinds of dress, and tuxedos and evening dresses, he said. That's what he said. I said, Gary, come on. I mean, you're a bit exaggerating. There weren't any tuxedos and evening dresses. But a little bit later, I was talking with Burton Grant, Amy's dad. Dr. Burton Grant and Gloria. And he said, Don, it, it was Gloria and me and Bill and Martha Thedford. We were going to something to the country club and we came with our tuxedos and evening dresses and sat on the back row and left. <laughs> so it really was. And so he came to the Lord that night, gave his life to the Lord that night, was baptized that night, and never touched drugs or alcohol or tobacco after that day. They, Karen had a, yeah, yeah, amen, amen. Karen... I mean, he was having DT so bad at one point that Karen put all kinds of cover they had in the house and sat on it, but he still didn't go back to drugs. He, he, made, he was still weird the rest of his life, but he did follow the Lord. <laughs> he, was, he was weird, but he was sober. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> I, I, Amy Grant's parents went to church there. He was one of our elders. At one, one of your point. elders. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Dr. Grant. But, was, uh, but Amy is one of the first ones who went. Amy and her older sister came, and Bert and Gloria, the parents, were going somewhere else, but she's the one who brought them over there. Huh. Yeah. How do you pastor a church where you've got people who are famous, for lack of a better way of saying it? How, how do you, because I'm <clears throat> sure not only they were at the church, but others would come to the church yeah. because they were at the church. Well, of course, Amy and Michael and Brown and some of those, they were like my kids, and so there's no problem there, except that there were people that would come because they were there, and we had to find a way to help them, at one point, help them get in there and sit in worship and not be surrounded by people, you know, and so we just let them come in a different door and sit at a certain place and things like that. We had to do things like that, but we had other famous people that came, and I, well, I remember, I remember there was one couple that came that both of them had been through divorces and just 
and, and divorced to marry each other, but famous people. And somebody leaned over to me and said, so-and-so are back there. And I turned to him and said, I don't want them to be back here. And then I thought, later I thought, God, that's not right. I mean, maybe. And, and so anyway, these famous people would come and I didn't want to be a groupie. And so I would just not pay much attention to them. Just, and then the Lord said, well, hold on. If you don't pastor them, who's going to? And so I, I realized that I had to make myself available to some of these people because they didn't have a pastor. And that, I mean, some of them were just in there, in and out, and that was okay. But some of them stayed there and, and grew in the Lord. But yeah. Wow. Um, do you keep up? I, I know you keep up at least with Michael W. Mm-hmm. Smith. Uh, uh, do you keep up with a lot of those people? Are yeah. they still in your life? I mean, I'm not as, I mean, in and out with Brown and Mike and so forth. But yeah, Amy, still very, very tight with her. And Michael, very tight. I mean, we go, we'll walk together and, and I'll go out with him some on things. And yeah, yeah. Um, what, what did you learn through the process of trying to be a pulpit minister in a church that was losing the shackles of its denominationalism, uh, mm-hmm. becoming a church of, of, uh, of outreach to the unloved and the unchurched, uh, uh, how, how, how did that shape and affect you as a minister? You know, I, I, I know that there were some really, really hard times because I let the elders know when I came to Belmont that I believed in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But then when we started having people that exercised some of those gifts, it became a problem. Uh, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't always easy. And I, I'll tell you, one thing that happened one time, um, we had... We had, a, we had a divided eldership that, was, that were our leaders. We had two people on one side that I called hyper-charismatics. That, I call somebody a hyper-charismatic that if I hear from God, you just do what I tell you because I heard from God. Don't argue with me. Don't, you, don't, you don't get a chance to judge this. I heard from God. We had a couple of elders on that side that were trying to control the whole church. And then we had a couple on the other side that had been studying the Holy Spirit for years and still didn't know whether he's talked or not. And, uh, and so here I'm, so we were closing out a conference and had an elders meeting that night. And I went home exhausted from the conference, but had to have an elders meeting that night at 7.30. And I went to sleep and I had, I don't, dreams don't, I don't have a lot of dreams, that, but I've had some, some that were very important. And I did that day, I had, had a dream and I was writing a letter to the elders and I, and I was saying, I refuse to walk any longer with a divided eldership. Well, imagine this. And so I'm asking all of you to resign. So I went to the elders meeting that night and I read what I had said. I said, I'm not going to walk with a divided eldership anymore. And we had just moved into our new building. And I said, you can have the building, but I'm not a hireling. I'm a shepherd. I'm not leaving the sheep. Maybe we'll go back. We'd been meeting at West End Junior High for five years. I said, maybe I'll go back over there. But anyway, I've, I'm not going to walk with you anymore, divided like this. Well, finally, the, and so that's all I said. And then one time they said, well, what will you do? Will you appoint an interim eldership? And I, I hadn't even thought about that. And I said, yeah, I, I guess so. Well, they talked for five hours. And at 1230 in the morning, by a vote of seven to two, seven to five, they agreed to resign. And so all of them resigned. And from that time on, we had a united eldership that was walking forward in strength. Wow. Yeah. Wow. But I told the people at the time, I said, this is either the most, auda- this is the most audacious thing that I've ever done and the most ungodly, or this is the Lord, one or the other, and you're going to have to choose. And so there are hard times in leadership, but we've got to, we can't, we can't settle into something we know is not right just to please people. I'm, I'm, by nature, so many of us are, are people pleasers, but we can't be. You can't be a ple- people person. You've got to hear from God. I mean, I, I, I told you a story of one day I was walking with Michael W., and, and I said, Michael, what do you do when you feel his pleasure? And what do you said, do when what? What do you do when you feel his pleasure? Feeling like God's Eric pleasure? Lytle okay. in Chariots of Fire. Yeah. What do you do when you feel his pleasure? He said, leading people in worship. 
I said, Michael, what are you doing that you don't really feel like you should be doing? He said, oh, Don, I'm singing in this banquet the other, in such and such a time. I said, well, why are you doing it? He said, because somebody wanted me to. I said, Michael, that's not good enough. If I want you to do something, as close as we are, but if I want you to do something and the Spirit of God in you doesn't say yes, then you do it. Otherwise, you're being controlled. And, the, and, and that goes to believing that the only way we will burn out ever, not by what God tells us to do, by either doing something God told us not to do, people-pleasing, or doing what He told us to do, but not doing it in the strength of the Lord. I believe that, and I live that. So the key to not burning out is seek first the kingdom of God as opposed to pleasing others. Yes. And do it in His power and strength. Yeah. And I mean, that's still, that's still where I want to be. I mean, I, I've had these conversations lately with the Lord. I mean, I'm telling him I'm 90 as though he didn't know. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I don't want to get in a rut. I don't want to get to, the only difference between a rut and a grave is one is deeper than the other. <laughs> and I don't want to do something just because I've always done it that way. I mean, I, we're wrestling all the time with who are we supposed, who am I now supposed to be? I mean, we, our Caleb group are going to Egypt, northern Iraq, and Turkey in later, later this year, in a, in a month or so. And am I supposed to go? I don't know. But I want, I want to if I'm supposed to. I don't want to if I'm not supposed to. I mean, yeah. So uh, I, I think a lot of people are saying, all right, how do you hear and know you're hearing the voice of God? And I, and I, and I always do it in reference to, uh, in fact, I've taught this before, and I believe I learned this sitting in his church one day. Matthew 16. I in Matthew it. 16, you have these two <clears throat> contrasting stories. First, Jesus says to his apostles, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the son of God. And, and he says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. You know, God revealed this Flesh to you. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that yes. to you, but my father is in, in heaven. The, yes. And then right at the end of that, Jesus says, I'm going to go down to Jerusalem. I'm going to be doing... You know, I'm going to get persecuted. I'm going to die. And, and Peter says, no, no, not you, Lord. And then he says, get behind me, Satan. So Peter, bless his heart, at one moment is listening to the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And at the next moment, he's listening to the enemy. Um, and, and, and how do you how do you know that you're hearing the Word of God? Well, the, the, you know, the, the tag on to that is... When Jesus says, well, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my Father's in heaven, I, th I think Peter would have had their, I didn't think of that by myself. <laughs> no, you didn't. Flesh, your Father. That's the way God speaks. Peter, pay attention. And then when he says, get behind me, say, Lord, you were looking at me when you said that. <laughs> I know, because that was the enemy talking to you. Now, pay attention. That's the way the enemy talks. And so, uh, I, I tell you, on the night when I surrendered as much as I knew how to to the fullness of the Holy Spirit and all that, I, I didn't have any kind of supernatural thing happen to me, but I made a deal with the Lord. I, said, I, I realized at that point that God had been talking to me, and I didn't know He was talking. And I remember John 8, 47 says that those who belong to God hear what God says. And so I knew I had been hearing God, but I didn't know it was God. I thought I was thinking of it. And, and so I, I made a deal with the Lord that night. I said, from this day forward, if I hear something that is unquestionably good and could not possibly be wrong, give me the energy and I'll do it, no matter what it is, because I'll know it's you. If I hear something, and then I realized something else, which really helped me. I realized that the enemy was throwing stuff into my head and then accusing me of it. And I caught a hold of it. And so I said, if I hear something that's unquestionably evil and couldn't possibly be right, I'm going to say, get back to hell where you belong. That doesn't, that's not mine. And so basically, that's how I walk. If I 
if it couldn't be wrong at all and I'm hearing something, and, and, and many times I'm hearing something, well, I know I didn't think of that, and I know the enemy didn't tell me that. This must be God. And so that's how I try to live my life, and that's how I believe we're to live our lives. All right, so in that regard, you said something last night that I thought was really profound, and we have a different audience here in some regards <laughs> than we had last night, a different uh, family listening in a sense. Um, you were giving us instructions for how to grow old in the Lord, and, and, and you said, if as you're young, and by the way, what do you classify as young? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, 60 and under. <laughs> okay, all right. If you're young, you said, get rid of your junk. Yes. Would you tell us about that again? I think that is such a valuable lesson. Well, I, um, I saw in my grandparents, my granddad was a worrier, and he got worse and worse and worse as he got older. My grandmother was a woman who was so surrendered to the Lord that she got kinder and gentler as she got older. And I saw that and learned that. And, and I realized that if we don't get addictions, for example, I don't care what it is, if, if we don't get addiction surrender in our young years, they get worse as we get older. And so the only way for us to grow old with joy and with purpose is to get all of our junk surrendered. And, and you were asking me later, you know, I mean, somebody asked, I think, in a, in a question last night, how do you do that? Well, I can, I can tell you that one of the things that was superior to me was when I realized that my destiny is to become like Jesus. And I really, I'm, I'm telling you what, I put my weight down on promises. I mean, that I, I, when, when there's a promise of God that I read, I am not budging of that promise. I've, in the past when I was preaching, I don't do it anymore because it's, but I, I've actually put my Bible down. I don't put my Bibles on the floor. I mean, I'll put something under it. I mean, I know it's just a book, but, but I'd put my Bible on the floor and stand on it as a way of saying I'm standing on it. I don't do that anymore because it's too, and you certainly don't do it in Jewish ministry. <laughs> no, <laughs> Imagine no, standing no, on the Torah. No, no. But, but anyway, when, and so I believe that I'm to be like Jesus. And I believe, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm still excited about life because I've got so much more to become. I'm not like him yet. I'm, I'm, I'm closer than I have been, but I'm not like him yet. And then passages like, uh, if we confess, he purifies. That's huge. I mean, if, you, if, if you've got any kind of a setting sin, don't ever rationalize it. Don't ever compromise. Don't give excuses. I mean, if, well, that my granddad was this way, my dad, well, so what? Uh, I mean, you're not supposed to, I mean, cr let all that junk stop with you. And, and then another thing that's huge, and see, I had, to, I had to really learn this one, is Matthew, I mean, the parable of the two debtors. When the debtor that would not forgive was jailed and turned over to the tormentors, and the Lord says that's how he'll treat us if we don't forgive. So, man, I'm... I'm a really good forgiver because I don't want to be turned over to the tormentors. And so I had to learn to forgive my dad, the woman he ran off with, the man who abused me. I mean, those were the biggies, the three biggies. But then it's everyday thing. <laughs> I taught a, a class at the downtown Presbyterian Church for 20 years at lunch. And, and one day <clears throat> I was going down there. I was just really feeling good that day. And there was, a, there was a woman trying to come in traffic, and so I, I'm just feeling so magnanimous that I just did like this to her, come on out. I mean, I'm, I'll let you in. But she wasn't turning right. She was turning left, and it was a four-lane street. And here she pulls out in front of me and stops. And I got furious. <laughs> I just thought, I would have never let you in if I'd known you were going to do that. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, I realized what's happening, and I broke out in laughter in my car by myself. And I said, honey, you stay there as long as you want to. I'll forgive you. <laughs> so, so it's little things and big things. <laughs> um, um, you, uh, um, you, you, you 
a lot of people would listen to you and think, well, you've had this fantastic life. It's easy for you to say, you don't know what I've been through. You made a reference to the man who abused you. Um, that, I know enough of that to know that you, you've had to learn very hard forgiveness. Yeah, and, and I had a lot to overcome. But Tell, I, Do you mind talking a little bit about that? Well, I just, um, I don't know. I mean, interesting, but I'm really glad. I don't know when it started. I don't know when it, I don't know how often it happened. I do know when it ended. And I don't know what before that, but I was 16 when I went to college. And he came to college and rented a place to stay and invited me over. And I went over to confront him. And I've been so grateful for that. And, and I mean, I don't say this with joy, but he later worked at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. And somewhere he picked up two young guys and took them home with him. And they robbed him and killed him. Wow. So, but, but yeah, I mean, that, that to me was the epitome, epitome of what I had to overcome because I had so much trouble getting my mind cleared and not those images coming back into my mind. And that's when I started, that's why believing I was to be like Jesus and and confessing when something comes, that's why that became so important to me. So God can, God is bigger than sexual abuse. God yeah. is bigger than. And see, well, I was in Florida at a, at a youth retreat. Uh, and this is the first time that I ever told it, uh, I, publicly at least. There were 400 and something youth there. And there was a young man who was giving his testimony at night that had been a, reared in a godly home but he had rebelled, but he'd come back, and he was a pastor, and he was good. To, I'm sitting over on the side just basking in it because that's my God. That's the way he works. But then when he got through, I realized the Holy Spirit was moving on me, and if I gave in to what was happening in me, I didn't know what I was going to act like. And so I got up and left and went to a dark spot in the back of the campsite, and I, I just let go. And I started wailing. I started sobbing. I I shook. I, don't, I thought, what in the world is happening to me? Some, I don't know what this is. And, but I, didn't, I couldn't even think. It was so engulfing. How old but were you? I was close to 50. Yeah. Probably in my 40s for sure. And, and I finally, when I got to where I could talk, I said, God, what is this? Is this self-pity? Because I didn't have the kind of rearing he had. And the Lord said, No. It's gratitude because I've made you whole. I want you to get up and tell your story in the morning because there are more kids that can relate to you than relate to him. So, I, so I, that's the first time I'd ever told about the sexual abuse. But sure enough, the kids start coming out the club. I mean, they just coming up to start talking to me. This one's been used. That girl's been raped. This 17-year-old kid won't ever know who his father is because... His mother was a prostitute. I wanted to take him in my, I wanted to put him in my back pocket and take him home, you know. But, and so from then on, I, I, I mean, obviously I'm not just blaring it all the time, but if I feel like it's going to be helpful, I tell it. Because in any group of people like this, there, I guarantee you there are people out here that have been sexually abused. There are probably people that have been raped. There have been all kinds of things. But I'm telling you, we can get through it, and we can be like Jesus. We don't have to, we can forgive. We don't have to live in that all of our lives. Wow, that's powerful. Well, um, we're about out of time. We've got uh, worship that happens, and, and so I, I want to always try to finish, especially for those of you who are in choir, rest assured, I will always try to finish by uh, 1030. I'll be very careful with that. But um, I want to know what you have planned. What's Don Fento doing in his 90th year? By the mercies of God. And what you said you're good for another 35 years? How many? (laughs) 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 Um, I, um, of course, we uh, we have worship and prayer every morning at Caleb, so I'm out there uh, four mornings a week. 
I have, a, I have a group of men come in to the apartment at, uh, one morning a week that I lead a prayer group. I have another prayer group that I lead uh, of men and women on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. So, the, I mean, that's just a part of my regular week. I've been in Nashville so long that there are all kinds of pastors that will, will just, I mean, they want to spend some time with me, so I do that kind of, kind of thing. But I also, we have a prayer room, and we ultimately hope to have a prayer house up on the hill overlooking the place where our Caleb uh, base is. And I, I really feel that it could be that the last days of my life, whenever that is, I mean, I may be, I, I, I would imagine that maybe another five or, or maybe even 10 years. I mean, I, you know, I, I told that there was this woman across the room from me that said, 120, not a day less. And I walked off and said, no, Lord. <laughs> not, I mean, I was 89 at the time. No, not 31 more years. No. I mean, maybe 10, but not 31. No. And, but anyway, I really suspect that the primary thing in my life in the closing is maybe prayer and worship. I mean, if we get that prayer center up there, I could see myself, and we may have some little bungalows, you know, that people can stay in for a moment. I could see myself being out there several days a week just in the prayer room and worship room. Because, as, I mean, we, we believe that you, whatever your vision is, pray there before you go there because God will open up doors. Wow. Would you join me in thanking Pastor Don for giving us this time? <laughs> he is very selective on where he goes and what he does at this point in his life. He counts his days, and he is careful about them. And I'm going to ask him to bless us uh, um, uh, as we finish. And as you bless us with Scripture, uh, if you don't mind, would you also be sure and uh, close us with the ironic blessing? And would you uh, stand up if you are yeah. able to? Or we got all, people, all kinds of people. I hadn't even looked at you over here, you know. Praise be to God. Yeah. Well, the, uh, I mean, the, these apostolic prayers that are in Scripture are the ones that I really grab hold of and, and the ones that I was sharing last night. And I really do, I, I do pray. I mean, the, we always have, we have to have hope for the future. We've got to have hope. We can't live without hope. So may the God of hope fill us with joy and peace as we trusted him so that we can overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's so powerful. And the one that I was asked to do at a wedding years ago, and it just so grabbed me that I've kept it in my repertoire, is the closing part of Ephesians 3, that may God, out of his glorious riches, strengthen us with power. We're supposed to have power. Come on, we're supposed to. May he strengthen us with power in our spirit so that Jesus can dwell in our hearts through faith. And we, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God and to know that love that surpasses knowledge so that we can be filled to all the measure of the fullness of Jesus. And to him who's able to do that, to him who's able to do that far more abundantly than all that we can ask or imagine according to his power at work in us to believe, to him be glory in the community of believers and in Jesus the Messiah through all generations forever and ever. And then, yes, I will say it again, this benediction in Numbers 6 is the only blessing that I know of that was actually worded by the Lord himself. He gave it to Moses to give to Aaron to bless all future generations of Israel. But we're grafted into Israel, so it's ours as well. And he said, when you pray this, when you bless them with this, I will put my name upon them. So get ready for God's name to be put on you as I, as I speak this. 
May the Lord bless you. Sometimes I'll have people just put their own hands on their head just so you can sense that it's God blessing you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Oh, we need kept. And may He make His face shine on you. Get close enough to Him that you radiate His love and be gracious to you. Pour out His grace on you, His power on you. May He lift up His face, His countenance upon you and give you His shalom, His peace. I pray that in Jesus' name. And I'm going to do two things. I'm going to say it in in Hebrew and then I'm going to chant it. Yevarechacha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Ya'er Adonai panavalecha v'chonecha. Yisa Adonai panavalecha v'yesem lecha shalom. Yevarechacha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Ya'er Adonai panavalecha v'chonecha. Yisa Adonai panavalecha v'yesem lecha shalom. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach, Sar Shalom. In the name of Jesus, the Messiah, Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you guys. I'll see you next Sunday. We'll talk law.